thank you. Uh, Y'all can be seated. Be seated and open your Bibles to the little book of Jude. The little book of Jude. And for the next two days, uh, I'm going to be speaking from the little book of Jude. Uh, the little book of Jude, ought to, we ought to read it as, as w at one setting. It, this is a, almost like as, uh, sort of like a note, an urgent note. It's a letter. It's not like a treaty. It's not like Acts, uh, not like the gospel. It's not even like Roman. It's not like 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and all of that. This is just a little quick note, and it ought to be read at one setting. It ought not to be broken up, you know, but we are not quite used to, we are not quite used to uh, reading that much scripture in one setting, and uh, uh, we are more used to uh, the person uh, talking about the scripture instead of uh, letting the scripture speak for itself. You know, and so we're accustomed to that, and I think that you, since you're so accustomed to that, it would be difficult then for me to just take this time and just read nothing but that, those 24 verses. But that's the way it ought to be, you, you know, and then I ought to comment on those 20 uh, uh, so verses afterward. Let me give you a little of background before we, well, let me, let's pray first. Let's pray first. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon this passage before we uh, get into it. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. And Lord, we pray that right now that your Holy Spirit would uh, enlighten us, that, that you would take these words and apply them to our hearts and help us understand uh, what we need to understand about this passage. Got our footsteps, got our mind, got our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. Let me tell you how I do Scripture, how I do my theology, how I study the Word of God, and how I prepare to give the talks that I give, uh, both here and around the country. And of course, what happens here. I began to think about, after these Bible studies each year, I began to look around and I began to think about what should I bring the next year. Uh, I consider myself uh, an amateur historian. And a historian would be a person, to me, who sort of understands the time in which they are living. And it's sort of like talking about those times and usually they sort of write them down, and 50 or 60 years after they're dead, they will know whether or not that person was a historian, that he had a good look at the time in which he was living. And, and so I think that, that that's the way I look at it. And, and so when I start to the scripture first, I go the, to the scripture with my concern, with the way I see society is moving. What is the great problems in the society? You understand? That's what I'm thinking to do, public teaching. What are the great problems? And of course, how are these, how are these problems affecting me? And then how are they affecting society? And for me, then, it becomes a, a burden, a burden. Then I go to the scripture, then, to try to get the scripture I need that speaks to the burden that I have. And then I begin to look to see in that passage was there any solutions to that? And, and how was they applied to that situation? And then I began to try to apply it, first of all, to my own situation. And then out of that burden, then I try to apply it to the bigger society. And so I began to look. And of course, uh, CCDA was born out of that. CCDA, to a certain degree, was born out of me ended up in Mendenhall, Mississippi, in 1960, and began to understand what had happened to the church, that we had taken this wonderful, wonderful gospel, that Paul said it is the power of God to deliver. It delivered the children of Israel from slavery. 
it, it's the delivering power of God. God's mean by which he delivers people is it, through the gospel. The gospel in it. And so what the condition we find people in, we find them in this condition, then we're supposed to believe then that the gospel can deliver. Then, as I was reading then, traditionally the gospel, as they are written, the full gospel, and I began to look at that and to see whether or not there was any precedent in the Bible to deal with the problems and the racism and the bigotry. And I was enslaved there as a black person in Mississippi. I, I think you folks that are free, and, and especially the white folks who have never been enslaved, they can't understand what it's like for a person to have a sense of his own humanity and then feel that he can do nothing about it. You feel like a terrorist. You feel like a Palestine person. You feel like taking a bomb and putting it around you and going into the territory of your oppressor and blowing yourself up. You want to make an expression the fact that you've been dehumanized. And I found myself like that. I found myself like that in Mississippi. A little older, when I was, when I was, I, my mother died when I was seven months old. I grew up without a mother. I grew up without a father. I grew up without the institution of love. But there was an old lady in my neighborhood. Every time we would go there, I would go there to buy some flour or some eggs or to buy things. This old lady loved me. As I always said, my, 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 my head, I was born with a big head. And my body had to grow to my head. And, and I was born with big feet. And my, 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 my body had to go to, I was born with big hands. And I was born on, and, 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 the, and the kids in the community, they laughed at me and they called me big headed. I didn't have a mother to love me as an enemy. I know my grandmother loved me as one of her 19 children. Now her twenties, her grandchild. I know she loved me that way, but she loved me as a group, as a part of a group. I did, I did not get that personal love. I didn't have a father to give me that personal love. But this old lady, this old neighbor, lady, she loved me. Every time I'd go to her house, she would always give me a cookie or a tea cake or something, and she would always say something nice about me. She planted into me some worth and value. But the society out there said I was a nigger, I was nothing. All around me, even my friends called me big headed. But I knew that I had dignity as a person. I knew that. And I really wanted to somehow express that dignity as a, as a, as a, as a, as a person. And she helped me to do that. Now, what I'm saying is, that was bad for a black person to think that he had dignity in Mississippi when I lived. I mean, you was nothing but a smart L.A. You know, and so all my life, I thought I had dignity. You know, you know I see, I, I, I think that uh, we Christians shouldn't be suffering from low self-esteem. I think we need to be covering up our esteem with humility. You know, you know, we should understand that. So I had some understanding of that as a, as a, as a child. And then when I found myself back in Mississippi after my conversion. I was converted in California. And I was converted in an environment uh, and with a group of people who was glad I was converted. They was loving people. And they was white and black. It was just at this time in 1957 when, 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 when th these businessmen, these successful people, they wanted their faith to express itself across these racial barriers. Things were happening in Mississippi and other places of the world. You understand? And here I was, I got converted. And so I was loved. I mean, I, that's why I'm able to do whatever I've been doing down through the years. I've had some friends that dearly, absolutely love me. You know, and so I have been affirmed in, in love. But I found myself in this situation in Mississippi. I, I looked around me. My, my little beautiful black girls, I was going, it was all segregated schools. They were getting pregnant at 13 and 14 years old. The, the one that was the cheerleaders, the one that had the greatest possibility, the one that had the greatest personality, those that could make it in life, they was dropping out of school, getting pregnant too early. The boys who 
resisted this dehumanization. Uh, they was getting locked in jail. In fact, of been uh, in Mississippi. We came to a place in the 60s that if you, wasn't, if you hadn't been locked in jail, you wasn't fit for nothing. You haven't discovered your humanity if you hadn't been locked in jail. I mean, that was a badge that we, that we was somebody, that we had resisted that system. And so I ended up in this little town, went back there, and ended up in this little town of Mendenhall. I mean, discriminate. We lived across the track in the ghetto. No running water, no inside toilets. This is in 1960. This is in the 60s. Uh, Megat was killed. Vernon Damon was killed. Three civil rights workers was killed. As I said the other morning, uh, they, Brown versus Board of Education was fixing to be in, instituted in Mississippi. And they began to build these separate but unequal schools so that they could avoid integration. And, and finally, the government said, you got to integrate. The white folks all left the schools and went to uh, the private schools. They took the school buses from the counties and gave them to the private schools. It was so bad that the IRS took their tax status. And then they took those schools and gave them to the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist Church. The Southern Baptist Church, the biggest denomination in America, and still brags about his bigness. They gave it to him. And they became then the official stewards of segregation. I want you to know our repentance is not deep enough. Sometimes people ask, why, white, why black folks are not coming over to white folks, breaking into these white churches? We are welcome to you. I know you are that generation that would do that. I'm not condemning you, but I want you to know that a lot of stuff has gone on ahead of you. And there is not enough repentance about it. There is not enough concern about it. Oh, do you even resist affirmative action? The very fact that those folks had been dehumanized, held in slavery for over 400 years, and now they want to express their dignity. And you say, don't do that. And the conservatives are worse than that. Evangelicals are worse than that. They call us communists down there. It was in the midst of that that my faith was tried. Was I still going to be true? That I believe the Bible was the word of God. That I believe that Jesus has redeemed us. That I believe the gospel was the power of God to salvation. I'm in this little village. I've already shared with you, two of my, I got to know uh, two white, I can make friends. I like myself for that. I know how to become a friend. And I know how to make friends. And, and I made friends with two white ministers. And both of my friends committed suicide. They committed suicide because they wanted to express, uh, wanted to break out of this segregation. And the church so turned their back on them. And they become so disheartened that they committed suicide. That's when I began to see the situation we was in. How we had taken this wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. This love of God. This gospel that's supposed to reconcile people to God and to each other. And to reconcile them across racial, social, and economic barriers. And to make a new worshiping community. That we were to be, as Peter said, that royal priesthood, that chosen generation, that peculiar people, that we were to show forth the praise of him who've called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. That we were to be a part of a new brotherhood in the world. That in this body there was neither Jew nor Gentile, born nor free, but we were to be one in Jesus Christ. This was to be the church. And here was that church in Mississippi that was perpetuating slavery with all of his power. Then I began to read the Bible the way I'm going to teach it this morning. I began to go to the Bible. And I began to prepare my sermons and my talk like a lawyer prepares case for trial. The way a lawyer prepares case for trial, if you go into a law office, you'll see all of these green books in the back of his office. You know what that, in those books, those are cases that have been tried uh, during the time of 
we've been here on earth, these legal cases. And those are called precedents. And so what a lawyer do then, he go to the case and he finds the case just like his case. Just like the situation he's seen to try. Then he will get the number and the name of that case. It will be so-and-so versus so-and-so. Or so-and-so versus the state. Or so-and-so versus that. Then he will look at the way that the judges has ruled on that. And he will see how the judges has ruled down through the time. Then he will come, take that case, look at it, and he will pick out that case as his precedent. And when he argued before the judges and before the jurors, he convinces them that you got to rule consistent with the precedent. It worked before you got to rule in my favor. You got a rule in my favor. Of course, there have been judges ruled in different ways. You, you, you understand? But he picked out the one where the precedent is in his favor. That's the way I began to read the Bible. I began to read the Bible and say that if it worked yesterday, it'll work again today. And that the Bible is the Word of God. I really believe this scripture that says the Word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than into it. So the problem we have today, and we'll get to that, is that we primarily today use the Bible as our therapeutic uh, devotional book. But reading the Bible should not be, devotion should be the outcome of you reading it. Uh, you need to read the Bible and also obey it. It is not they that hear the word will be blessed, but they that do the word will be blessed. So we've got to live by the word of God. And there's enough there, practical, for us to live by. If we put that into practice, we can be effective. The problem we have today is that we have turned this Bible in for ourselves. There is basically two forces in the world. Might be many forces. But it's the force of God. God, and you could say the force of Satan. But if there's a third force, it's ourselves. It's ourselves. We are forever trying to organize things around ourselves. And the sadness that I'm coming at, the reason I'm coming at this message here this morning is that we have developed this big, fat church, and it's developed primarily to meet my needs. My needs have become the most important thing. The will of God is secondary. And that's what the church exists for. It exists to carry out the will of God. Jesus came into the world to do the will of God. And the church is the incarnated fellowship. God lives in it so that we can carry out his will. It's not our will, but God's will be done. And God makes us a promise then, if we will seek his will first, then our will will be met. We have turned that around now and made the church there so that my needs can be met. And so you can see then why this prosperity, Christianity today, and you can see why this church growth thing is so powerful. And, and, and what's happening is the prosperity is coming mostly to the person that is leading these institutions. They are the ones that are prospering. And they are doing very little of that. And they are making us think now that being rich is the absolute blessing of God. Jesus did not put it that way. Jesus warned people about richness. It warned people about the deception of richness in the world and how hard it is for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. And now we have made that. They have made that. And I listen at it. And the television station is corrupt with it. It's corrupt with it. And just at the time, just at the time with the people I'm working with, in my ghetto, this is the first time in my ghetto that I've got young people in there, 
young couples that had gone to college and the university and had become lawyers and doctors and nurses. And in those families, they're making $100,000 a year, $150,000 a year. This is the chance now that we could build an economic base. This is a chance that we could build schools. This is a chance that we can make life better for our people. And they are trying to get more. And, they're going, and they are going, they are driving, they are commuting to these places. And so God can bless them more. Bless them more. Bless them more. And they need to be utilizing this which they have. And so our people are being, dis, are being, be, being a, a, attracted, distracted, distracted from the will of God to meet their own needs. And it, it's so much in our society that it almost seemed like it's right. It almost seemed like it's right. I heard people say self-preservation is the first law of human nature. That's the worst lie that's ever been told. The saddest people I meet in life is people who over-focus on self. People I meet in insane asylum. People who I meet who are divorced. People who I meet is in trouble. The kids I meet is in jail. They're over-focusing on themselves. That's a bad focus. If anyone come out to me, Jesus, let him deny himself. That's not an abandonment of self. That's putting yourself in the hands of a loving God who loves you and who cares for you and who will take care of you if you seek his will. If you try to live in obedience to him, God's will is everything. It's not a piece of what God wants to do. Jesus says, Lo, I come, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord, to do thy will, O God. And the way we learn how to do God's will is to do what it is we already know that God wants us to do. And if you start doing that, you will get the most perfect will of God. God will reveal himself to you in a powerful way. So, so you see how, that's my introduction. <laughs> okay, that's my introduction. That's the burden. Uh, that's the burden that I come with. I come with seeing all of this bigness and little effectiveness. I come seeing all of these resources being misappropriated. I come seeing how, why can't we learn how to pool these resources in a way that we can put our young folks to work, that we can create some little business enterprises in those neighborhoods to provide for our people, that we can produce some of these goods and services. Uh, that, that's why I was glad that the hood man was here last night. I, I, I'm not here wanting him to give us anything. I, I want him here to, to help us to be able to provide loans and, and, and opportunities to build housing, decent housing, and health care places in our neighborhood so our people can have a better quality of life in our society. And so we can teach young folks the skills of being a plumber, being an electrician, being a, a mason, and so that we can teach them how to finish concrete and to do those needs that we have. Our community is deteriorating in our community. And we need that capital to, to do that. It's available to us. All housing is supported by the federal government. Don't say it. FHA supports all housing. You couldn't get no housing in America. It wouldn't be for the federal government. Fannie Mae buys all the loans and make that money available in the community. And so, but we don't have people there ready to utilize it. We don't have people there in the community doing that. And, and it's, somebody said it yesterday. In the black and urban community today, we still have an apartheid system as it relates to economics. And in your town of Detroit, man, and Detroit have had the greatest income of our people over my lifetime. And today in Detroit, you couldn't buy your liquor unless you go to these wonderful new immigrants that have come in. They are the ones who run the enterprises in the neighborhood. And our young folks are not running them. And then we're standing out bragging and turning these big churches into museums. And, think that we're doing, and thinking that that's going to impact somebody. It's going to impact the leaders who are leading it. It's doing very little to improve the quality of life 
of the people within the neighborhood. CCDA is here, believe in inherited dignity of the people down there. The people at the base level have suffered long enough. And unless we do something about it, that's gonna be a world's thing. I, I, these kids who are putting their lives on the line when they're having these international economic conference, I am one that sort of somewhat believe on them. I believe is, is, is uh, globalization mean that they take all those jobs down to Mexico and work those poor people. I've been there and saw those factories and working those people for $4 a day and then crooking that stuff back up here. And I come in, oh yes, I think we should do all we can to, to work with, the, with Mexico and strengthen the quality of life of the people of, of Mexico. But this is a new form of exploitation. They can't exploit us anymore. Now they got to exploit, find other people to exploit. We need to be talking about justice in the world. How do we give people an equal exchange for their goods and services? We go over there and extract, we used to go over there and extract all of their bauxite and all of their gold and all of their mentors out of there. It was only the Arabs that brought a halt to that. It was only the Arabs that got organized and said, we're going to not let them get all of our oil and let America run their cars for 21 cents and 19 cents a gallon. They're going to have to pay us equal exchange for it. Couldn't we do the whole world like that? Couldn't we do the whole world like that? Couldn't we make an equal exchange for goods and services? Wouldn't that lift the poverty all around the world if we would do that? But the church is not concerned with that. The church has done joined with this exploitive system and that we are going along with the system. What Paul said that wasn't supposed to happen to us has happened. He said, be not conformed to this world but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's the will of God for all of God's people in society. Okay. Okay. Let's go to our passage. You can see what's on my heart. And what's on my heart is, is that the church is not only indifferent to it, the church is working against us. The church is working against us. Instead of the church pooling its resources, the government needs to start taking tax exempt away from churches. There, there, there need to actually be some criteria set up for the church, for the way that the resources are used. It's all tax exempt. It all ought to be used for the human benefit. It ought to be used to carry this good news of the gospel to humanity. And that we should be an example of the goodness of that in the world. Too much of that is being used. Too much of it is being used to satisfy our own ego in society. And so we at CCDA, we want to develop, I'm committed today to developing urban churches. And I'm committed, you're gonna hear about it this morning, I'm gonna bring him up on the stage. I'm committed to beginning to train and equip the people in these urban communities to know how to do small enterprise development, where they can begin to provide some of their own goods and services and labor in the community. I'm committed to that. So that we can have the joy of participating in caring the gospel. You know, I always feel good when somebody comes to my community and from Africa, anywhere, and have a, would have a good mission project. And I feel good when I can go to the bank and draw out some money and give to that project. I feel good about that. But I should, I feel good about doing things for Habitat for Humanity. I feel good about helping develop uh, projects in our neighborhood that improve the quality of life. Everybody needs that. We all need to be given to that. And our churches are doing very, very little. Very, very little compared to what we can do or what we ought to be doing. And that would just really enrich the church because we would teach people how to tithe. 
we, we, we show them the value, you know, of serving God. And if you see the value of people praying for you and God's giving back to the giver, you know, and God blessing the giver. You can get me understand. There's, there's no contradiction there. Let's go to Jude. So what is Jude about? Let me read Jude. You see why I'm going to Jude. Let me read Jude here. I think I'll read uh, four verses and then finish up my talk. Listen to what Jude said here. I'm going to read it from, let me read it from the, the CCDA Bible. You know, we got a CCDA Bible out there, and uh, you can buy it on, at our book uh, store. We first tried to sell it, but the, when we printed it, uh, the people put guard and I pitch in it. And, uh, and somebody said, uh, you shouldn't have your pitch in the Bible. We was explaining CCDA in there. And then, then of course, uh, when somebody complained it, we stopped trying to sell them. But boy, let's turn the pitch out. That's right, turn the pitch out. Buy the Bible and turn the pitch out. <laughs> Go to my booth and buy the Bible and tear Wayne Garden and pitch out Lee Mine in there. Okay, okay. Let me read Jude here from, from uh, let me read the first uh, four or five verses of Jude, and then I'll explain to you what I want to explain this morning. From Jude, a uh, bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to all who are chosen and loved by God the Father and kept safe by Jesus Christ, I pray that God will greatly bless you with kindness, peace, and love. My dear friend, I really want to write to you about God's saving power at work in your life. But instead, I must write and ask you, to defend the faith that was once for all delivered to his people. For some ungodly people have sneaked in on a, on a, among you and are saying, God treats us much better than we deserve, and so it is all right for us to be immoral, do as we please. They even deny that we must obey Jesus Christ as our only master, and Lord, but long ago the scripture warned them that their godly people would be doomed. I'm going to stop there because tomorrow I'm going to tell you about how he doomed them. What is this book here about? What is Jude saying here? This was what was on Jude's mind when he wrote the book. He wanted to write to the saints and let them know and he's going to say that this morning how much God loves them and he wanted them to understand that I have a destiny I have a future I have a present has already been taken care of in God's redemptive act he wanted to write to us to help us to understand this salvation. This salvation was this, that we had been delivered from our sins of the past, that our sins had been forgiven. He wants us to understand that God is with us today, then as we become conscious of our sin and confess our sin, that God is with us today, to keep us saved right now. That he's in our community. He's there with us. That's the second aspect. We've been saved from the past. We're being saved in the present. That God is there. If we, and when we trip up, he said if we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then he wanted us to know that our eternity was taken care of. 
that Jesus had already said that he was going to prepare a place for us. And if he go and prepare a place for us, he was going to come again, and he was going to receive us unto ourselves, and that we would be with him. And so now we did not have to live any longer for ourselves because our destiny is settled. This salvation has been taken care of. The redemption is complete. Now we can give our attention now to serving God. Because we know we got a God that loves us, that cares for us. Jude had wanted to do that. Jude had wanted to do that. But as he sat down to write, the Spirit of God took control of him and said, instead of you writing about this wonderful salvation, you can learn that from the Apostle Paul. He already told us about the great redemptions in the book of Ephesians. He told us all about that. He told us about that in the book of Romans. He told us about this grace of redemption. He talked about that in writing to Timothy. But now he said, what God wants me to write to you about is to tell you and to warn you about this. In the last days, Paul warned us this, that people would depart from the faith. They would give heed to subducive doctrine. They would be almost like worshiping demons. And so you got to be careful. And so he was, he was overpowered, and he said, let me write to you about this turning away from the faith. And let me teach you that you have got the content for this faith. And this is important here, what he's saying. we got a content for this faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints, and that faith was brought in person to us by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, in the Old Testament, Abraham depicted what faith was like in the Old Testament. And God called him out and sent him out, and our faith in the Old Testament is modeled after Abraham. In the New Testament, our faith is modeled. faithful unto death, and he brought this obedient faith into the world. And there he said on the cross, it's all finished, that he was obedient to death. And that's what faith is. Faith must endure. Faith must endure. I meet these people who try to convince me that they uh, got faith by the words they talk. Faith has to do with how consistent you have been. Faith has to do with the fact that you have endured. Faith have your faith been tested by trials and trouble? Have it been sharpened by pain? That's what faith, faith is that faith that comes from God that was delivered by Jesus Christ. That faith that pushes on to the end. As the Hebrew writer says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and then he went through with it. And so he said this faith, now this is important, here. This is important, and I, maybe I'm, I'm getting too fast. Let me go back to the first verse and see what Jude says here. And then I come to that verse. He said, Jude, a slave, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know what a bond servant was in the Old Testament? Uh, it was a, a person who had been a slave, but his master had let him go free. And then he loved his master so much that he wanted to stay with his master. Then he had to have a mark on him. And they would usually put a mark, a ring in his ear so that they could know that he was a slave. So if the authorities come, that they could know that he wasn't holding this person in an unjust way. But the very fact that the person was staying there is because he had been loved so much by the master. And James is saying here, instead of him saying, I'm a half brother, that's what we would have said. We'd have been name dropping. We'd have been name dropping. Uh, you know, this, this Jew here is a half brother of Jesus. And he could have said, uh, he could have said, uh, okay, he, he, he could have said, uh, I, I, I'm Jew, you know, I, I'm the half brother of Jesus. But he didn't. He said, I'm Jew, a slave, a slave. Of Jesus Christ. I'm a slave because I love him so much. I'm a slave because I'm living out that love. 
let's, let's get that. Let's, and then look what he says here. Look what he says here. The first thing that he wanted us to know here, really, you know, that's his introduction, but the first thing he wants us to know in verse 2, he says, uh, to all who are chosen, and verse 1, to all who are chosen and loved by God, let me tell you, I'm finding this out. I'm finding this out as I do ministry. The most missing element in our society today is love. Is love. The sheriffs and the criminologists and most of those people are letting me see that most of those young men and women who are in prison are there because they didn't come from a nurturing family and a loving environment. To, to miss love, to miss love, you have to even be careful if you are working for people who is suffering from love because they will misuse you and abuse you and also get love for themselves. Uh, they, will, they will manipulate you in order to satisfy their own egos, to satisfy what they won't satisfy. in society. So look what he's saying. The first truth, the first truth that God wants you to understand, listen to this. This is what the gospel is about. Is the fact that you have been loved. The cross is symbolic of how much he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We as Christians should not be seeking to be loved. We should be seeking to give love because we have found love. We have found love in life. Yeah. So he says this. This is the first thing. This is absolutely crucial. I'm, as I go into the prison, you know, the boys that's been reformed, when I go in there, they call me Grandpa Perkins. And they call me Grandpa, and I say to them, you can, I give them the permission to call me Grandpa Perkins. I reserve that. I tell them that I let you call me Grandpa Perkins. And they say it with such passion. And I'm finding out, I'm becoming for most of these kids the grandfather that they've never had. They never had. And the power of that the power of it, you know you can almost manipulate it. They, they love you so much you could all, they can almost manipulate it. In our prison, they don't buy socks and underwears for the kids. And I'm working with a group of them. And they was, as, they was complaining about not having socks and underwear. And they're a teacher that makes everything, gets everything ready for me when I come in. And she was complaining about it. And I created the fund. And I have an underwear fund. And every month I buy, she send me an order list. And I buy socks, underwear, and T-shirts for those kids. These are in the GED class in the society. And they just love me. They love me. That's what the gospel is about. The very fact that we have been loved, we're supposed to share that love with others. That's the truth of the gospel. You know, as I listen at these southern preachers preach, I wonder what it is. I wonder what they're talking about when they're talking about the gospel. What on earth are they talking about? Is it hating the gays? Is it hating the homosexuals? Is it hating somebody? Those are not good lifestyles. We know that. But if you was one to Jesus Christ, you was one because you was loved. You didn't start off by hating them. You started off by loving them. And if you're out of the situation you're in, you came out of that situation because somebody loved you. I told you I came out of the situation where I didn't have love. But an old lady loved me. And she showed me what love was in society. That's our message. That's our message. And we tell them about Jesus to show the extent of that love. Now, Jesus loves is the one that redeems us. I want you to know that. 
It's not my love that redeems you. My love can only become the light. The light that shows people the way to Jesus. Let your light so shine before the humanity that they might see through your good works so they can glorify the Father which is in heaven. But we've been loved. Paul says we have this treasure in these earthen vessels. What is the treasure we're talking about? We have this light that if these vessels can be cracked, the light can shine out and that people can know that we've been loved. That's the first truth, and that's important. That's important. I, you know, I watch, I'm around people all the time. I'm working with people all the time, and how they are manipulating the situation in order to try to get love. Manipulating the situation in order to try to get love. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. You need to be, stay, you need to know that you are loved. You need to know that. You are not a healthy person if you don't know that you are loved. You are loved. Okay. Now he says that. So he makes that point here that they are greatly loved. I pray that God will greatly bless you with kindness and peace. And in the King James Version says, and multiply your love. Now what do James say here now? I mean, what do uh, Jude say here now? And then he says in verse 3, my dear friend, I really want to write unto you about God's saving power. Instead, I must write to you about defending the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. And that's not what you are hearing today. Uh, this, you see, the beauty about Christianity and the weakness in our Christianity today is that Christianity is becoming more hearsay, folklore, and what somebody else said about God. And that we are quoting what somebody else said about God. The uniqueness about Christianity is you can know God. You can know God. You can know God personal. And that you can have a conversation with God. You can listen to God. And God can speak to you. Be quiet and know. We really think that prayer today, as I listen to people pray, they really think prayer is altogether us talking to God. That's just one side of it. Real biblical prayer is listening to God. You want to model a real prayer? You know where to go to in the Bible? In the Old Testament? Go to Elijah in the cave. Elijah is in a situation he have obeyed God to the limit. He have got rid of all the false prophets. And now Jezebel is at him. And he runs as far as he can run and he gets up in a cave. He don't know what to do. I have obeyed you, God. I have done your will. And now what must I do? And in that cave, he began, to, he wanted to hear from God. And then there you remember this lightning flashing outside. He poked out and God wasn't in that. This whirlwind and all of that was sounding. God wasn't in that. And then he heard that small, still voice. If you read that careful, that voice spoke to him and told him exactly what he's going to do. He said to him, you have fulfilled your ministry. I love you. I'm going to bring you up to be with me. But before I bring you up to be with me, I want you to go back and I want you to anoint some kings. I want you to do all these kind of things. And then I'm going to take you home to be with me. And so Elijah heard the voice. He heard the voice because he listened. Look, prayer is not always asking God. Prayer is listening to God. Let's continue here. I got to bring it to it. Oh, my time is gone. My time is gone. 
because what I got here now, my time is gone, and I know my man there uh, is sitting there wondering. Let me tell you, we'll, we'll pick up here tomorrow. What I want to do here is I want you to hear about uh, a development program that I am getting 100% behind because it will be, become really one of the first CCDA institution that's going to train people in economic development. Come on up here, uh, dear brother, and take a few minutes and tell us about this uh, program. We're going to take a couple extra minutes here. Uh, Good morning. My name is Brian Fickert. I'm a professor of economics at Covenant College. As you can see, growth is my specialty. <laughs> All right, let's get the most important things out of the way right away. I'm six foot ten. The weather is fine. It's very hard to buy clothes. My wife is normal size. My kids are not. I am the director of something called the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College. We are a research and educational center devoted to helping the local church to look more like Jesus Christ by bringing spiritual transformation and economic development in the context of poor communities. We define economic development to mean helping the poor to help themselves through their own work. And I'm here today to tell you about a training opportunity for you to help you and your faith-based and church-centered ministry to look more like Jesus Christ. In order to tell you about that, I want to take you on a trip with me. So let's get on an airplane together. I get the exit row. There's more leg room. We're going to travel first to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to an inner-city neighborhood there where there's something called the Bethlehem Community Center and Church. There's a young woman there named Maya who is a 25-year-old single parent. And she wants to be able to support herself through her, her own work. And she's good at cutting hair, and she wants to start her own small business, her own hair salon. The Bethlehem Community Center and Church reached out to Maya, and they first said to her, you need basic training in financial literacy. You need to learn how to manage your own money. And so they put her through a faith-based financial literacy class. They then have put her into a small business training class where she is learning basic principles of how to start and operate her own small business. And while she's in that class, she is saving her money. That money is being matched through something called an individual development account, so that at the end of the process, she will have between three dollars and $4,000 to start her hair salon. Maya has already started cutting hair, and upon her completion of the savings program, she will have the capital she needs to expand that small business, to, to be empowered to support herself and her child through her own work. Now get back on the airplane with me again. We're going to travel to the slums of Nairobi, Kenya. If you go down deep into those slums, you see children who are covered with sores, and there's flies living and dwelling in those sores. You'll see open ditches with human sewage running through them. You'll see people living in shacks. But as you walk deep, deep, deep down into that slum, you'll see something else. You'll see a church that meets in a 10 by 12 foot room constructed out of cardboard boxes that have been opened up and stapled to studs. That church wanted to minister in its community and it started what's called a rotating savings and credit association. It's like a very small credit union. One of the people in that community's name is Manoa. He's a cobbler. He's never been able to get anybody to lend him any money. And for the first time in his life through this church's ministry, he was able to get a $3 loan that enabled him for the first time to prepare shoes that are now on display so that as people walk by his little shop, they see shoes on display and they buy those shoes, Manoa has been empowered to help himself through his own work. Now I get back on the airplane with me, we're going to go to the Philippines. It's July 2000, the rains are falling. There's a garbage dump called Pietas. Some of you may have heard about this. The rains were so heavy in July 2000, that the garbage dump collapsed and it crushed several hundred people under its weight. Those people are primarily children who live in tunnels they have made through those garbage dumps and those children try to support themselves by picking through the garbage and selling whatever they can find that's of any value. There's a church on the edge of that garbage dump and for years that church had run a feeding program 
And when the, when the garbage dump collapsed, the church said, we've got to do something to get these kids and their families out of this situation. We have to empower them economically so that they can support themselves through their own work. That church started a rotating savings and credit association. Immediately, 45 of the mothers of those children joined. They are now saving their money, acquiring the capital they need to move themselves and their children out of those dumps. Three different stories in three very different contexts. What do Maya in Chattanooga, what do the folks in Kenya, what do the folks in those garbage dumps in the Philippines all have in common? Three things. I'm a professor of economics. I'm going to give a quiz at the end, so write this down. Three things they all have in common. Number one, none of those folks who were helped have ever heard of the Chalmers Center for Economic Development at Covenant College, and I like it that way. Number two, all of those folks experienced the Church of Jesus Christ being what Scripture has called it to be, the body, the bride, and the fullness of King Jesus in those communities as they brought economic empowerment to the low-income persons living there. Third thing that they all have in common is that those churches were all trained by the Chalmers Center for Economic Development. Through God's grace, we've been given the gift of being able to equip churches around the world to minister in word and in deed in their communities. I want to see more churches like that. I'm here today to tell you about an opportunity to get trained in how to help the poor to help themselves through their own work. On your seats are some brochures that I think you've all been given that describe a training institute that will be held the last two weeks of May in partnership with the Christian Community Development Association. John Perkins will be our keynote speaker. I want to emphasize that this training institute is not a conference, it is a training process. There will be pre-institute assignments. You will then come for three to 11 days of training. I'm, get, I'm getting bonged over here, okay? I'm going fast. <clears throat> three to 11 days of training, and then six months afterwards, you will submit a completed ministry plan, which we will then review to help you to implement that ministry plan in your community. We're doing this not on our own, but in partnership with Food for the Hungry International, World Relief, and CCDA. We are bringing in practitioners from some of the leading ministries around the world who can train you in how you can empower the poor in your communities. I want to emphasize one thing. You do not need to be an expert. If you have a heart for ministering to the poor and you want to empower them in Jesus' name to support themselves, this institute is for you. Last two weeks of May, May third. Oh, it's on here. May twenty through thirty first. Uh, the brochure is there for you. There's also a website that gives you a lot more information. We certainly hope that you'll join us. Thank you. Well, yes. Yeah, th this is something that I'm passionate concerned about. That we might get the skills that we need to go back to those neighborhoods and be able to develop enterprises. I look forward to many of you coming and spending those days with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. And we just pray that you would bless us. And now, Lord, we pray that you would bless the remaining of our day. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Now, you have a booth, don't you? So find his booth. You, are, you should be able to see him at the at the um, at the booth.